Hello, I'm Tom Butler. I'm Brendan Duffy. And I'm Tom Wheatley. And, and you're, you're listening, listening to the James Bond, Bond ATZ podcast. podcast. Join us as three lifelong 007 fans go on a journey of discovery. We're on a mission to discover everything we can about cinema's greatest spy films. By learning about the people who made them, in front of the camera and behind. Hello and welcome to this brand new podcast about the world of James Bond. Yes, another podcast about James Bond. As we said in our intro there, we're three lifelong James Bond fans. And in this podcast, we're going to be embarking on our own journey of discovery into the world of the 007 films. As I said, my name is Tom Butler. I'm a uh, film journalist. I've been a James Bond fan for as long as I can remember. I think the first Bond film I can remember seeing at the cinema was was GoldenEye, but I feel like I've seen all the others on, you know, TV, Christmas time, what have you. Personally, I have been on the set of a James Bond film. That's exciting. That's probably one of the best things I've ever done personally. We'll talk about that at some point, I guess, in the future. And I also went to the launch of Skyfall, so that was also a great thrill. Um, and I will, I will take any opportunity I can to talk about James Bond, as anyone who knows me uh, will tell you. How can I compete with that? Well, the only way is <laughs> the only way is down. <laughs> I'm Brendan Duffy, and um, I first got into Bond when I was quite young. Again, Christmases and Sundays with, with Dr. No, Goldfinger, usually on the TV. Um, and then started to collect the VHSs. And it snowballed from there. Always looking forward to the, the next releases at the cinema. Absolutely love Bond. Um, there's really something quite special about it. And I'm Tom Wheatley. I'm also a journalist, but I'm not a film journalist. I've been pretty much obsessed with Bond since I was about seven years old, when my dad used to make me watch it every Christmas. I say every Christmas, it was basically every weekend. Um, he still makes me watch them now when we go home and see, see each other at uh, Christmas and, and, and times like that. Since since when I was a kid, I've been... I think my first Bond film at the cinema was Goldeneye. Um, and I've, I've seen every single one of them since then at the cinema. Um, and I used to go to school with uh, Tom Butler. Uh, we spent a lot of time there talking about Bond, listening to Bond soundtracks. And uh, I think we must have... We must have been to the cinema together quite a bit to see a few of the Bond releases. So now I'm just obsessed and watch, listen and kind of research every bit of Bond that comes up. Hence the podcast. The show came about after many discussions about the Bond films, where we found that beyond the contents of the films, the plots, the characters, the cars, the gadgets and so on, we didn't know enough about the making of the films or the people responsible for the almost 60 year film franchise. There are many great books about the films, and if you're looking for a detailed look into the stories behind the films, we'll inevitably be recommending some as we go. Instead, here, we'll be shining a light on the lives and careers of the people who brought these films to life, from Ian Fleming's books, some whose careers were defined by Bond, and some whose work came to define Bond. And uh, here's how the podcast is going to work. We'll be doing it in an A to Z format, so it won't be in chronological order, which we hope will add some interesting variety to each show. Each film and certain key creatives will get their own special episode down the line. We'll be covering the key characters of all the films, up to and including No Time to Die. And we'll be doing those in alphabetical order, according to their character name. On the rare occasion that an actor appears in multiple films, we'll cover them under their real name. Make sense? Maybe not now, but you'll get used to it. We'll also be doing the key creatives who shape the films as well. So, some brief caveats before we get on with the show this podcast is in no way affiliated with the james bond brand with eon or the fleming estate and we're only going to be looking at the films themselves while we will touch occasionally on the source books this is about the films we've researched each episode as extensively as we can and all that information comes from a range of sources however we're only scratching the surface here so we do our best to make sure the information is accurate but sometimes we get it wrong if you want to correct us or something add some more detail or share an anecdote about any of the subjects we talk about, just send us an email at bond a to z podcast at gmail.com and we'll talk about it in a future podcast. So on with the show where we begin with the letter A. A is for Adam. Ken Adam. Sir Kenneth Adam, OBE was born Klaus Hugo George Fritz Adam 
in Berlin, 1921, to a Jewish family, as you would imagine that it would be a difficult time to be growing up as a Jew in 1920s. Uh, so him, him and his brother were having a fight with a playground bully uh, who was wearing a Hitler Youth uniform. And due to the increase in discrimination that was going on in Germany at that time, his parents decided that they would send them away and were sent to Craigen Park in Edinburgh. Upon arrival, he anglicised his name to Kenneth and then was then shortened to Ken. So the rest of his family stayed in Germany and they assumed that the Nazi regime would be short-lived and they were sadly wrong. So in the summer of 34, they reluctantly came to the conclusion that being Jewish in Germany was proving too difficult and decided to also move to the UK where they settled in Hampstead in London, which meant that Ken Adam and his brother could then return and live in London with, with his parents and continue his education in London. Whilst in London, his mother ran a boarding house and took in other refugees from uh, from all different European countries, uh, fellow Jews that needed to be boarded. So he was introduced to a number of them were artists, and that's where he got a real taste for design and just creative uh, work. He was then introduced to Vincent Corder, who was a Hungarian art director, when he was working on uh, Night Without Armour at Denham Film Studios. So Vincent Corder nurtured Adam's passion for films and prompted him to start studying architecture. So he left school and became an apprentice at a company that made bomb shelters. On the side, he also signed up for evening classes at the Bartlett School of Architecture at UCL. Then World War II breaks out and... Ken Adam was working with the company that was designing bomb shelters, air raid shelters, um, and illustrated books on on all the gas masks and all paraphernalia from from that time. He was a German citizen. Obviously, that proved quite difficult at this time, being in England. But he was still seconded to design bomb shelters in 1940. And further to that, with his brother... They were two of only three German-born pilots to serve in the RAF during the Second World War, which wow. is pretty mm. pretty impressive, um, and became a bit of a, a hero as well, and had no foibles about uh, essentially going against his own people. So after his RAF service in the war, he became an art director on mm. Around the World in 80 Days, so it was a film in the in the fifties, David Niven, were, Niven, which he won his first Oscar nomination for. Ah, that was his. It wasn't his big breakthrough. His big breakthrough was the Trials of Oscar Wilde, and that's where he won his first award at the Moscow Film Festival. So he'd worked on that with Cubby Broccoli together. Ah, there we go. So that's that's his in. There's his in to Bond. Yep. Um. So he recruited him for Doctor No, uh, which had a tiny budget. So he was given this small budget to create sets and and design and give that feel. So he says, I had to fill three of the largest stages at Pinewood Studios with sets. There was no time to do sketches and no one looking over my shoulder. I wanted to do away with all the old materials of set building, wood and paper, and use new materials. My crew were very excited, but it was taking an enormous risk. So he actually overspent by six thousand pounds, which at the time is a, mm. a bloody lot of money. So he was very worried about what they would think because they were out shooting in Jamaica at the time. But they returned. They saw the sets, and as you can imagine, you, you know the Doctor Knows underwater uh, cave is incredible. So yeah, yeah. they, of course they thought the same as well and so they were impressed so that on the back of that all the designs he did for dr no stanley kubrick was impressed and so wanted to get him on board to design sets for dr strangelove 
Ah. Mm. Um, so he, yeah, he really likes the nuclear reactor, and the the scene with the tarantula with the grill above. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So Kubrick was a big fan of those sets, and got him on board for Doctor Strangelove. So Doctor Strangelove, the the, the iconic set in that is the war room. Yes. Incredibly iconic and has influenced so many of that that type of room with like leaders, world leaders sitting around a big round table, the the ring light above. Yeah. Um, so much so that Steven Spielberg, when he when he was given a, a lecture at the Directors Guild, Spielberg went up to Ken Adam and said, "Ken, that war room set for Strange Love is the best set you've ever designed." And then five minutes really? later, he came back and he said, no, it's the best set that's ever been designed. So <laughs> high praise indeed from uh, Steven Spielberg. So the war room's so iconic that legend has it, Ronald Reagan, when he first became president, apparently asked to see the war room. <laughs> <laughs> There's that, it's kind of disputed whether that happened but uh ken adam says it happened so i'm gonna i'm gonna go with yeah it. we'll stick with that yeah. so with the bonds he was given pretty much free reign creatively because ian fleming's novels don't really cover what the the, the detail of of where the the villains live they, they, he brushes over it which means it lends well to ken adam's style of being extremely creative and and sort of making a fantasy scope which also lent well to another place that he, he that existed but he couldn't see so in goldfinger in 1964 fort knox he had to design fort oh, knox yes. which of course he's not allowed to see the closest he got to it and this was because the kennedys were big fans of bond so he got permission to f- do a flyover of fort knox huh. amazing uh which Ken Adams described at the time as very dull 1920s Art Nouveau. So yeah. clear, clearly not that impressed and uninspired by what he'd seen, which is a good thing, I guess, because out of that he had to get his creativity flowing and come up with the with that impressive interior. There's The interior of actual Fort Knox, US presidents haven't seen. So is that true? It, wow. It would have been, Amazing. yeah. So he he said, I built it like a cathedral of gold over 40 feet high, right up to the studio roof. And for the gold, we we had a special lacquer finish that made them look better than the real thing. (laughs) Um, So that, I mean, it's absolutely fantastic set that is is iconic. I wonder if anyone else has... um, I I can't think of any films that have got um, Fort Knox in them. I need to do a bit of research into that and see if people have copied Mm. his idea of what Fort Knox looks like. Yeah, because that potentially is the only knowledge of what it looks like. Anyone's got. (laughs) Yeah. Presidents. Yeah. So in Goldfinger, it was Ken Adam who came up with the idea to place the ejector seat in the Aston Martin also. Um, Good idea. An idea. Very good idea. He said, the ejector seat was an idea that came from my days as a pilot. So his experience in the Mm. RAF has then given him that inspiration. Yeah. Another iconic scene. Um, I mean, that's... Everyone always references the the ejector seat, and and the Bond films are still doing so now. So moving forward, in probably, I would say it's the most iconic. It's the one that everyone thinks of, and it's the one that has been referenced in a lot of things. And I actually was aware of it first in The Simpsons, <laughs> before Bond, because in in the episode you only move twice. The the volcano lair is that Hank Scorpio. Hang, hang Scorpio and you only move twice yeah <laughs> I wouldn't I, that, that the idea of the the, the the volcano layer that's been used quite a lot not just in, in comedy parodies hasn't it it's it's quite a common theme in probably computer games and stuff as well Absolutely. doesn't the, the, the Incredibles that's, that's have a him. volcano layer as well yes yeah, yes they uh, do. the villain does yeah so that's something that he is you know that's that's him that's his his idea that's really good idea that volcano there <laughs> It's a great idea. Yeah. <laughs> so um, the exterior obviously was a real volca- volcano in Japan, but the interior was created 
at Pinewood on a massive scale. And Ked Adams said, I'll never forget Cubby Bo- Broccoli asking me how much it was going to cost. I had no idea, obviously. And he said, well, will a million dollars be enough? And I said, sure. <laughs> so that that set, <laughs> that set cost more than the whole budget for Doctor No. Wow. And that's that's five years later, and they're all you know, spending a movie budget on. I'm a sure set. I read. I'm sure I read somewhere that um, if a stage man gets given money to do something, he will always spend all of the money because whatever he's <laughs> got, he'll bit. just find a way to use it. Whether that's an explosion or something shooting across the screen, he might as well just use it. Yeah, well, that that got destroyed as well. I imagine it'd be quite sort of heartbreaking building all these things that get inevitably destroyed. Yeah. Well, they they build them and then they take them down, don't they? It's it's um, yeah, it's quite an amazing business, really. Mm. So then, moving forward again, um, another iconic, huge set is the super tanker in the Spy Who Loved Me. Oh yes, yep, yeah. Which at the time was the largest soundstage in the world, uh, yeah, so big, big that they had to build a new stage, which is at Pinewood, the 007 stage. So that was built. In 1977, especially for this. And it's filled with water as well. <laughs> filled with water, yeah. Um, and the that actual set was lit by Stanley Kubrick in secret. Ah, yes. So um, Ken Adams says, he spent three or four hours with me, telling me how he would like the stage. And of course, the whole thing being in secret appealed to Stanley's sense of drama. So... Yeah. Kubrick was filming Barry Lyndon... No, they'd done Barry Lyndon because Ken Adam worked on that as well. Well, is he was just in the area and he just called him? I suppose he did live around there, didn't he? He, he, um, well, he got him in and they had a difficult working relationship after Barry Lyndon. Oh. And, and Ken Adam said he would never work with him again. So this was as close as it was going to get us with them working together again. Right, right. Great lighting in that scene, though. Well, in, in all those scenes, it's, I, I seem to remember yeah. that's one of the longest kind of end sequences for a Bond film which just goes on and on and then mm. blowing up metal doors make the most and... of it yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just like that like that <laughs> well it's amazing when you see how big it is and it's like that. I guess the, the question would have been where do you put the lights like literally how do you light yeah. it where you don't see the lights and uh, yeah. ama- amazing piece of, uh, of set design really yeah, yeah absolutely yeah. incredible so in that film we also played a part in the underwater Lotus Esprit Mm. So that was that was his sort of idea with the special effects supervisor Derek Meddings, um, and Meddings said that when we decided to turn a sports car into a submarine, Ken Adam came to me with the suggestion that we use the shell of a new Lotus Esprit. Neither of us knew anything about the aqua dynamics of water, underwater driving, but we went ahead with the Lotus because it was the most beautiful car we could find in England. <laughs> so that car. Um, was actually able to go underwater, incredibly. Yes, yeah. Uh, it wasn't... You, the the stunt driver inside had to be fully <laughs> wearing an underwater gear to be able to breathe because it, it yeah. wasn't watertight, but it could actually go underwater. Amazing. Um, and, oh, you definitely want to go in that, wouldn't you? Yeah, it'd be incredible. Maybe uh, just in a shallow pool. Just in the bath. I don't know if I want to... <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't want to take that... <laughs> I'm not going to take that too far out. So Ken Adam said the last thing we wanted was the audience to get the impression we were using a model car in a studio tank. And mm. you do get the sense that that wouldn't have worked as well because it was another iconic scene. Yeah, it would have looked a bit stingray, wouldn't it? <laughs> yes, it would. Um, and so his final film for the Bond franchise was Moonraker. And he had to research the space shuttle so he actually went and spent time with nasa who were developing real you know space programs uh moving forward so he he got real world uh technology Mo- moon rakers based on real world <laughs> space designs <laughs> it's probably the only bit that is yeah <laughs> so he designed this uh space station that took took more than two hundred thousand man hours to build uh, at a studio mm. in France. Absolutely huge, again. And then that's that's his that's where his Bond 
Bond era started. So 60s and 70s was, you know, very heavily Ken Adam. And, and moving forward, it's always, it's it's still... It's still the template, him. isn't it? Because yes, it is. Even when you look at the trailers for No Time to Die, you can see that uh, you know Safin's got an underwater lair, and it's yeah. heavily, yeah. heavily influenced by Ken Adam. It's all sleek lines. It's all grey, uh, yeah, like matte metal and all yeah. that sort I mean, of stuff. They're, they're always striving for it. Even in like Tomorrow Never Dies, you think about Carver's wall of screens, the way it's lit, the way it feels. It's, yeah. it's desperately trying to be Ken Adam. I, I like a lot of the... Because you're talking about the kind of bigger things, the big set pieces he did, but mm. his attention to detail and a lot of the smaller stuff as well, just rooms and, and, and things like that. I'm assuming he probably had a lot to do with kind of like M's office and all those kind of bits and pieces that may seem like simple part, parts of a... Oh, it's just a room with these things in, but I bet those... I mean, those designs to those rooms are so archetypal. I think they still use exactly the same... Yeah, features they, in, they, in the in in the modern M scenes in in, in the offices. They um, certainly did they Inspector. Did in yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, interestingly, you say that because he won two Oscars in his career, and what well, one for Barry Lyndon and the other for The Madness of King George. Mm. So they were both period pieces. They weren't these grand, extravagant, lair type fantasy sets. Yeah. They were true to life. Yeah. Uh, impressive rooms, like you say. You're saying he's not just a lair man. He's not just a lair man. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, he also designed the car for Chitty Titty Bang Bang. Wow, well that's pretty good. Uh, that uh, Bond link to Chitty Titty Bang Bang constantly it's, coming back. Uh, we'll, yeah, it's we'll be talking about on. that film a lot. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> definitely. There's a lot of crossover there. Um, so he also did the Ipcris file. So there's a cross, there's crossover yep. there as well. Goodbye, Mr. Chips, Sleuth, Adam's Family Values. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, oh, I suppose it's, if, <laughs> if there's anything you're going to take from Adam's Family Values, it's probably the sets. Yeah, that's the thing. The, the set is an iconic thing in that. I can remember what the set looks like, just, just in, in my mind. But yeah. the film, the plot, no. Was nothing. there a sense no. of why he stopped working on the Bond films, Brendan? Um, No. I did not that I could I could find I couldn't find because he's very proud of his bond this time with Bond unless you've been able to I don't know no. I don't I don't know anymore no, no I was just look just just curious um, yeah it, it, it is strange because that period of Bond was pretty much it's like the it was consistency of actors and consistency of styles and stuff over that that whole the whole period that it kind mm. of um, just spans the whole like seventies eighties era so to lose the man who did all of the Big set pieces seems quite strange, but um, I'm yeah, sure that we'll one has got a view to a kill. Yeah. We'll set us right. Yeah I'm, yeah, I'm trying to think of the ones after it to see if anything massively changed. View to a kill is actually good. It is quite different, isn't it, than the than what you see in Spider Love Me and Moonraker? Yeah, for many reasons, but I can't remember any amazing set pieces in 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 View to a Kill. Octopus, he has quite a few. Um, so he got knighted, Brendan. He did. How do you? Yeah, how do you know that? You started off with Sir Ken. <laughs> You gave us a teaser. You gave us a very obvious teaser. <laughs> yes, he was. In 2003, in the birthday honours, he was knighted for his services to film production design and to UK-German relationships. Ah, so, so not just not just his film work, also in, into the his time he spent with the RAF. Um, so in September 2012, he handed his entire body of work to the and I apologise for the pronunciation here. Deutsche Kinematek? That'll do. That'll yeah. do. Take that. <laughs> yeah. Nobody here knows, uh, <laughs> can, can really correct you. So one of, one of the listeners can. You can get an angry email. That's fine. That's fine. I'll, I'll deal with that. Um, he, that's 4,000 sketches for his films across all, all of his periods of, uh, of activity. Photo albums to his films, storyboards memorabilia, his military medals, identity documents, and his two Academy Awards, all donated mm-hmm. to this uh, film cinema, uh, film museum in Berlin. Oh, I've got to go to that. I wish I went to Berlin a while ago. I wish I'd known about that. Mm. So I'm not sure if it's you. a permanent, uh, there is a permanent section, but I don't know if they show it all. 
I did right. have a look on the website, and it seems like periodically they'll have um, like a feature, like a special exhibit. Mm-hmm. So he nice. he died uh, in 2016. He was uh, just after a short illness, and he was 95 years old. So it's a, a, a good age to get to. Yeah, yeah. He, um, I, th- I found a quote that I thought was quite nice. I thought reality was dull, and if I give the audience something unexpected, they'll enjoy it. This is quite nice. Very nice. Yeah. Simple. Uh, we salute you, Ken Adam. Uh, absolutely instrumental in setting the template for Bond. Uh, I think we can yeah. all agree on that. Absolutely. Another one for that Hall of Fame. A hall of, uh, definitely a Hall of Fame. Ever, well, ever growing Hall of Fame. Well, this is episode yeah. one, so I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> the future Hall of Fame. Oh, straight Private into the Hall of Fame. About. First entry into the Hall of Fame. First, he's a Hall of Famer, definitely. Nice. So that's Ken Adam, Sir Ken Adam. A is for Adams, Maud Adams. So Maud Adams is fairly important in in the annals of James Bond in that she is the only Bond girl to have appeared twice as a main character. She actually appeared three times, although it's fairly... it's, It's not exactly... A justified claim because the third time well the first time was in Man with Golden Gun, second time was in Octopussy as the title character the third time was in A View to a Kill but nobody can actually find any picture of her in A View to a Kill she had such a small cameo role that apparently she didn't even know that she was in being filmed at the time that um, there are there's a scene where there's a bus and there's a lot of people come off of it and apparently she's one of them so people say that right. she's in three Bond films She's not really. She's in two. She mm. was just at the set at the time of filming, so she's not really a character in it. But anyway, you know who um, Maud Adams is. She's a fairly important character in the Bond series, and um, she was born in on the 12th of February 1945. She's from Lulia, Sweden. She was also a model as well as an actress. She speaks five languages, Swedish, French, German, Italian, and English. She's also the president of a cosmetics company called Scandinavian Biocosmetics. And she's also famous for being quite modest, or she certainly seems that way in a lot of the interviews and the times that she's spoken on, on screen. Uh, she never really liked attention. She, um, she said quite famously, I think it's natural for Swedes, generally speaking, but especially for northern Swedes who are known to be taciturn and introverted. So it's something that's props up quite a lot and when you're researching her it's quite difficult because she doesn't do a lot of interviews she doesn't seem quite keen on it in an interview she said that she was a, a professed gangly tall skinny girl and she never thought that modeling would be an option did some local fashion shows when she was younger her first shows were at a local shopping mall that when it opened in 1955 was one of the first was was one of the first indoor shopping centers in the world she was spotted by a local photographer and um, she was used in as a model for a tourist brochure for the area. He took pictures of her fishing and, and water skate, skiing, and she described the pictures as of her as being like a little wet rat in a bikini that had no shape whatsoever. So she doesn't <laughs> seem very... She's not the most confident of ac- actors that's involved in this whole um, the, the Bond series. She got picked up by a company called Ford Models, and they advised... Adams to go to Paris for a year to gain experience working with some of the biggest photographers in the world. She worked a lot for Elle magazine and a a few others. They then brought her to New York and she became one of the biggest names in the business. She married a graphic designer called Roy Adams. She moved into TV commercials and she was in her first big film was a 1970 movie called The Boys in the Band. I've never heard of it. Heard of it. Have you? Yeah, I don't know what it's about. No, I've, I've not <laughs> actually researched that one. She was then told that Cubby Broccoli, uh, the producer of Bond Films, wanted to meet her as he was beginning to cast for The Man with the Golden Gun. This is where she started getting involved in the Bond films. But really, up until that point, she hadn't done a, a, lot, of, um, a, a lot of films. So before that she started in Man with the Golden Gun, she'd been in a few uh, various TV shows, things like Kojak, a lot of secondary parts, but never did anything that big until she got involved in Man with the Golden Gun. She met with the Broccolis. The producer asked, uh, asked Maud Adams to come visit the hotel uh, 
and uh, to meet the wife of, Bob, of Cubby Broccoli, D- Dana Wilson. Um, apparently Dana had a strong influence on who was cast, uh, Adam said. She approved everyone, Sean Connery, Roger Moore, and she ended up getting the part based on that approval. From there, she went to Bangkok, where she met Britt Brit Eklund, another Swedish actress and model. And at the time, she she kind of she met Britt Eklund, and Britt Eklund said famously at the time that she hated her because she heard about Maud getting the role of the character in in Man with the Golden Gun, and because she was Swedish, she she she'd read the or heard that a Swedish actress had got that role, and so she just assumed that Maud Adams had got the role that she was going for. So she wasn't a big big fan of her until she realised that there were two roles for uh, that had Swedish women in in the actual film. Apparently, Roger Moore used to joke quite a lot with them on set, as you can imagine. He was quite popular with them. Uh, he was also he also became very close with both both uh, Britt Eklund and Maud Adams, and he called them Mud and Bert. <laughs> I don't know why, but you can imagine Roger doing that. There's a uh, Maud Adams talks quite a bit about a, a press conference that they went to, and, and Maud being slightly more reserved and introverted she said it was quite a big affair cameras everything everywhere interviewers and she uh, and roger basically just kind of looked after her and and kind of made jokes and stuff like that to make her feel better all the time um good old roger uh the the man the golden gun film grossed nearly 100 million dollars worldwide um and maud said of the film that she really didn't like the scene where and then you'll remember it quite well where she, roger moore pulls a arm behind her back and kind of pushes her on the bed and it just didn't seem that that was in um in keeping with the rest of the film and in and, and roger's style and she just said it, it just stuck out like a thorn sore thumb she wasn't very keen on that scene she said he was one of the biggest champions uh, always sweet and lovely he was always a wonderful guy uh, he was always mocking himself and his ability but he was a very smart man uh mammy gone gun made Maud an international star that led to other movies like Rollerball and Tattoo. I've seen Rollerball, I haven't seen Tattoo. From there, she also went on to starring in a show called The Chicago Story. And then um, she got another call from Cubby Broccoli that they wanted to test her with James Brolin to replace Roger Moore in the next Bond film, which was going to be Octopussy. Mm. At the time, she knew something could be up and maybe it was an attempt to get more to sign on for more Bond films. She wasn't entirely sure why she was getting involved in this casting process. She thought it was something to do with Roger. Then she found out that she had it. She said, I, I had the part if I wanted it. Um, I'd never quite been able to figure out why. Which, is, which at the time, you probably would think, this is quite weird. I mean, I've just been a <laughs> ca- character in a fairly recent <laughs> Bond film. Why are they testing me for this? So she probably thought at the time that it was just some weird casting ploy for... To, to, to make Roger come back or something like that but she was quite confused but obviously still took it because it was quite an important role so that made that um, more done the only actress to appear as the lead Bond girl in two James Bond films I think they needed to ne- uh, they needed someone who was going to look the part of a Bond girl and not be inappropriate Adam said I think they felt I was a, an appropriate actress to play the role I think in, in that she was kind of talking about Roger Moore and him being an older character in it and they couldn't have pulled in a young actress to it they wanted somebody to be more um that fit m- nicely with roger and they knew that she did in earlier films but also if you remember um i think uh, at the time that was when roger was kind of looking to leave the series and also never say never again was being released the same year as octopussy so it's probably another example of them going look we've got to put th- go going with all guns blazing we need an actress that we can trust that's going to do a good job. And we know that she did a good job in Man with the Golden Gun because that made loads of money. We need Roger Moore back to do the, to do the, full, to do the film because we can't go up against Sean Connery with a, a, new, a new person. So it was probably a, a bit of a, 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 an attempt to make sure that that film was going to be good and they'd make as much money from the actors as, as they possibly could in comparison. Octopussy grossed quite a lot more than Man with the Golden Gun, so nearly $190 million worldwide. There's... Another Swedish actress in Octopussy, Christina Weyborn, who plays Maud Adams' right-hand woman in the, in the film. I can't quite remember off the top of my head. And of the of the whole series, Maud Adams said, it's been a very nice club to be a part of over the years. Quite a nice little understated comment about it. Yeah. And she says, looking back on it, how can you not really enjoy the fact that you're a Bond girl? It's pop culture, and to be part of that is very nice. Uh, she also said, I'm pleased at what I was able to do, but I've never thought of myself as a great dramatic actor. I don't like to talk about myself 
and my work that much other than the fact that I've enjoyed it and got better at it. And just interestingly, to finish off, a nice pop fact for you, which I didn't know because I've never watched this series, but she guest starred in an episode of That 70s Show in 2000, appearing as a bridemaid to Tanya Roberts, along with Christina Wayborn, who was a co-star in Octopussy, and Barbara Carrera. All four of them share the title of Bond Girl. So I might have to watch that episode just to to see to see that pulled together. Wait. Maybe just find the clip online. I'll I don't know if you. I'm not sure there's easier. I, I'm not sure there's many clips of that '70s show online. I've definitely never seen any pop up. But get um, the box set then. I'll get the box set. That's Christmas sorted. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Mordan's really important character uh, across all of the the Bond girls, um, and she was very keen on the idea, and I, I think this this developing way that Bond girls and and women who who acted in um, Bond films is there's the kind of growing power of how women have been portrayed in them and I think that's why Octopussy was such a big thing for her to be a part of because obviously she's she's the like the main character in that film really so yeah very interesting that they brought her back so soon after being in the other one I guess that's sort of what set, makes her so unique in the whole Bond Bond world I guess it is very unique and, and, and very strange I'd love to I, don't, I can't find any real evidence or information about why they did that or what was the what the decision process was but I'd love to know, I, I, like finding mm. out what that process was. Well, maybe our listeners might be able to tell us and let us know. That'd be lovely to know. So there we have it. Maud Adams. A is for Aki. Now, Aki is a Bond girl from the film You Only Live Twice, um, played by the actress Akiko Wakabayashi. Now, uh, born in 1939, in uh, Japan, she's uh, an actor, and she began her film career uh, in 1951 with a film called Hanayomi Sanjuso, and that's Song of the Bride is the translation. There's going to be a lot of Japanese in this one, guys, so apologies mm-hmm. in advance. Okay. Uh, so that was 1958. That was her sort of film debut. Um, but her career really took off um, as a star in Japan. Uh, her stardom sort of began when she signed for Toho Studios, uh, which is the uh, Japanese, the famous Japanese studio responsible for the Godzilla films, uh, the kaiju type films. So, really good studio, that. Really good studio, yeah. So she appeared in a host of their films: uh, 1962's Godzilla vs King Kong. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Dog- Dog- you might know this one about Dogora, the space monster. That's in 1964. Yeah, I that one. And also Ghidorah, the three-headed monster, also 1964. I think we watched that one when we were about 13. <laughs> there was a time <laughs> when they put them all on the TV, wasn't there? We videoed them ah. all and, and watched them. Yeah, classic. So, right, this is, this is where it starts to get interesting. So, uh, in 1965, Akiko was cast in a film alongside another uh, future Bond girl called Mi Hammer. And now the film that they were both cast in was called Kokusai Himitsu Kaisatsu Kolon Kagi no Kagi. And so that translates as International Secret Police Key of Keys. And this was a James Bond parody series, mm. quite interestingly. Mm. So... She was starred in this uh, James Bond uh, influenced sort of parody. This is 1965, the height of Bond mania. So the whole world was going Bond crazy. Um, uh, And it's the fourth film in a series. I think there was five in the end. Now, uh, in another weird twist of fate. So this this film, International Secret Police, Key of Keys, this became the basis. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen this before. But for Woody Allen's directorial debut, which is called What's Up, Tiger Lily. Have you ever heard of this? I haven't seen it. No. So the weird story behind this is, and I know this is going a bit off the beaten track with uh, with Aki, um, but they basically the, the the American distributors had bought this film uh, and had ma- made no money off it, and so in a desperate attempt to to make some money off it, they gave the film to Woody Allen uh, as a comedy, as a rising comedian at the time, and asked him to to redub it and make it into a comedy. So he redubbed it. Uh, and so she's in it, as is Mi Hammer, who's also in um, uh, You Only Live Twice. But it's uh, it's this weird comedy, and he changed the plot of the film entirely. They added musical sequences, all sorts of weird stuff. So anyway, that's 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 just a weird uh, side uh, note weird. on the on the I'd, on her I'd, career. I'd say I was going to watch it, but I might not watch it. 
Well, reviews. <laughs> a lot of the reviews are quite good uh, for What's Up, Tiger Lily, and a lot of people say um, I've, I've read note people say calling it Woody Allen's funniest film. He himself mm. has distanced himself from it, and probably uh, for good reason. Um, mm. So now you only live twice. So uh, Lewis Gilbert, who directed that film, he flew to Japan because obviously they were filming this one on location in Japan. It was going to be a huge um, location for the film. He flew to uh, Japan to audition local women because the only most of the locations they wanted to film in, the conditions were that they could film there, but they would have to use native stars in the film because often what would happen is they would make films in Japan and then they'd bring in people from Hawaii and other places to play Japanese people. But they said, no, you have to use Japanese actors. So Lewis Gilbert flew over there. Now, uh, Wakabayashi um, and Mi Hammer were both chosen and they were picked um, through an audition process because it was suggested that they would be able to pick up the English language quite quickly. Now, Wakabayashi was actually cast as Kissy Suzuki, and Mi Hammer was mm-hmm. cast as a character called Suki. Right. So this is Lewis Gilbert. We brought them to England three months before shooting and tried to get them to speak English. We put them into English families and sent them to school in the day. So this is them trying to pick up the English language. But um, we'll talk about this a bit more when we get to Kissy Suzuki in the A to Z. But, but basically, Mi Hammer didn't get, well, get on well with learning English. So the producers swapped the actors and the characters over and when Akiko became Suki Suki's character name changed to Aki Um, so yeah that's a bit complicated but yeah so basically now um, Wakabayashi she's now playing Aki the the role the role that we'll um, we'll come to know her for Mm -hmm. Now, um, I don't know if you remember this film very well, but um, Bond meets with Aki. She um, works for the Secret Service in Japan. So they meet at a sumo wrestling match. Um, and he's obviously expecting to meet up with um, Nico Henderson. But when he goes to meet him, um, actually, he meets Aki instead. And uh, obviously, she's this beautiful, resourceful Japanese secret agent. It's a great twist in the film. Uh, she obviously really uh, famously in the film has a flair for fast driving and so she's very much Bond's counterpart in this film it's the first time a, a female character has really has been Bond's match yeah, it's so, a pretty um it's a pretty important one isn't it because it ticks a lot of boxes for and quite early on as well to have a female powerful kind of bond equivalent that's not an american yeah doesn't pretty, um, doesn't yeah, need his yeah, rescue pretty yeah. bold move quite early on She's Tiger Tanaka's top agent in, in the Japanese Secret Service. And so she becomes Bond's basically guardian angel and, and, and rescues him quite a few times from a few sticky situations. And she drives this amazing Toyota 2000 GT, um, which is like Bond's car. It's tricked out with um, with, with mm-hmm. gadgets and stuff. Uh, interestingly, Wakabayashi, she actually couldn't drive. So um, when you see her driving the car in the film, it's actually a stuntman in drag. Um, so it's quite funny. So, um, so would, she, would she be the first... Bond female counterpart agent. I think so. I can't think of, I can't think of anyone anyone before that. I mean, there, there's, be, there's there's women with guns, but they're not really yeah. Bond counterparts, are they? No, she's uh, yeah, mm. she's she, she's a very important uh, Bond girl in the in the early years, definitely. So there's the, the the story then leads on, and then obviously Bond then has to become the the Japanese fisherman. Now, unfortunately. For whatever reason, I can't remember in the film, but they decide that Aki shouldn't be the one to marry Bond. Um, so then that's where Kissy Suzuki comes in. But Aki is then trusted with uh, transforming Bond into the fisherman. And this is obviously the famous scene where he gets the the makeover into into a Japanese man. Uh, probably yeah. a bit... Mis- pro- S- seamless. Yeah. Seamless. Yeah. Probably wouldn't stand up uh, now. <laughs> but obviously on the night before he uh, he goes on to, uh, to, to marry Kissy Suzuki... The uh, Spectre Assassin comes and uh, is going to drip poison into Bond's mouth down a fishing line. Yep. Do you remember this? Yep. Mm-hmm. Bond rolls over, um, poison goes into Aki's mouth and Aki dies. Obviously, that's very sad. Uh, but that's that's the character. But um, w- writing about the actor Wakabayashi in an article in Playboy magazine, the screenwriter Roald Dahl, he said... Girl number one, uh, she's the uh, it, it was played by Akiko Wakabayashi. Everyone liked Akiko. She was gay and gentle and virtuous, and we were all sorry when she had to be murdered and sent home. We had her killed in bed with Bond alongside her while they were sleeping it off. The manner of the killing was interesting and complex, a sly, silent Japanese method that involves a long th- length of cotton thread and a tiny little bottle. So interestingly for Wakabayashi, her list of 
credits after the You Only Live Twice extend to just one film and one TV series. Um, so apparently, uh, as a consequence of injuries that she sustained during her acting career, she was very she was quite um, uh, busy before You Only Live Twice. She told the uh, magazine called G Fan. This is a fanzine dedicated to kaiju films. She said, "I had injuries in some movies and TV shows. Some bones suffered damage. It didn't look serious because nobody saw anything from the outside. But it's very painful. And now I just enjoy a slow-paced life." while helping my partner, who's also an actor. I want more of a simple and slow-paced life. So she basically retired from uh, mm. from the public eye from there. Um, one person that did manage to track her down, she doesn't do interviews now. Um, she doesn't make appearances as Bond girls. She's very, very much a private person. But one person who did track her down was the author Raymond Benson, uh, who wrote a lot of 007 novels in the, in the um, 90s and noughties. He was researching a book set in Japan, The Man with the Red Tattoo, and he went to Japan, met Miss Wakabayashi and uh, Mihama as well. Uh, and he said, I spent a couple of hours talking with her about her career and her experience on You Only Live Twice. We met in a restaurant, we took a stroll through the park, and she had retreated from the public eye many years earlier and was enjoying her anonymity. There is another theory around why she retired from the public eye, as did Mihama, um, in that she'd become disillusioned with the fame that the films had brought for her. And one of her other co-stars suggested that because her and Mihama had been sort of quite scantily clad in the Bond films, that perhaps she became prejudiced against in her career. In fact, both of them did. And so people were mm. unwilling to cast her, which is quite a shame, really. But um mm. Her last uh, public interview was in 2006, and she says, "I'm very grateful for those who, to those who remain to be my fans long after I've retired. I love movies because they amuse me and they make me think about many things. I'm interested in the staff as well as the cast. Movies, both old and new, are my friends in my life. So that's it. Lovely. That's mm. Aki, uh, Akiko Wakabayashi." A is for Amasova, Major Anya Amasova. So Anya Amasova is an agent of the KGB, a character in The Spy Who Loved Me, portrayed by Barbara Bach. Um, so at the begin- right at the beginning of Spy Who Loved Me, pre- pre-parachute, you've got um, M recalling Bond from a mission. So uh, upon leaving and w- working his way back, he is ambushed by a team of bad Russian bastards. Uh, and, they are quite bad. And he's able to kill one of them before parachuting off, off of the mountain. Uh, and the agent that he kills is the lover of Anya Amasova. And she has also been recalled by her perspective, uh, perspective M, uh, General Gogol, of the KGB. So the parallels are already there right from the off before they've even met. So then when they finally do meet, which is during that uh, the, the show at the pyramids in Egypt uh, with, yes. with Jaws, if you remember that, it's a classic scene as well, uh, where Bond actually gets the blame of, of the, the killings that, that Jaws has done. So that's how they first meet. Um, and then throughout the throughout most of the film, they're, they're they're pretty much got the same objectives and and mission, and trying to achieve achieve the same outcome, but whilst also trying to outdo each other and and just be better and just one up each other each time. During which, inevitably, they fall in love. So, Anya accompanies Bond when they go and meet Stromberg and during this time Anya learns that Bond was the one who killed her lover so she mm. she's then basically saying we'll get this done we'll be professional we'll get this done and then when it's done I'm going to get my revenge she's then captured held held captive and up until this point she has been she's she's matched Bond in each and every way, I would say, much like from 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 what you were saying earlier, yeah, with with Aki. So until this point where she's actually captured, that's that's where she becomes the classic Bond girl in a way. So, but before that, I would say she's another example of a strong 
female character uh, that, yeah. that well and truly matches Bond. So during this time, she so she is held captive. Bond obviously rescues her. She then attempts to kill Bond, but uh oh, she is in love with him too much. <laughs> too much. It's too much yep. to kill him. So she doesn't do it. And and then they, they they end up in in bed together and that's with the classic famous line where Roger Moore's Bond is keeping the British end up. So Yeah. Um so moving on from that, the the plan was to have Amasova make a cameo in Moonraker. Ah, um that been good. as a woman in bed with General Gogol. But hmm, that's not quite so good. Sadly, it never happened, which, you know, yeah, would have been interesting to see it anyway, wouldn't it? Would have been interesting to see. I'm not sure, quite sure what they're going for with that. <laughs> no, it's probably why they can Confu- get... Confusing twist. Yeah. Uh, in Shaken and Stirred, which is a book on the feminism of Bond, uh, scholar Robert Kaplan said that Anya's character is groundbreaking within the Bond girl paradigm because she is imbued with a plausibility that surpasses her predecessors. So there is an added depth to this character, I would say, and, and she's not just there to look good. She is a great yeah. character. I love that scene uh, where they're sort of... What, what do they call it? Agent Triple X? Is that what they call Agent it? Triple Agent Triple X, X yeah. yeah. And they go bring, bring him in and uh, or, or bring Agent Triple X in and, and it goes to the, the room and you're thinking, oh, it's going to be the guy... But it's her, yeah. That she's the agent. I love that mm-hmm. twist. It's brilliant. That is good. Twist. There's a lot. There's a lot of. They, they did put a lot of thought into Spy of Me and and the storyline to it. It wasn't just simplified Bond storyline. They did try and do some stuff. But I was, I was find the problem with um, Agent Triple X is that, and it, it's the same problem that exists with a lot of the every every time people talk about oh this female character in a Bond film is quite an important part of the storyline and the, the whole Bond series because it's a strong female lead that's you know like Bond and it's showing that women can be like Bond she just like by the end of the film she just becomes screaming like yeah. love interest for I Bond know. and it's it just and it does that it even happens with like Michelle Yao where in the later ones so it's it's a bit annoying that they they very rarely get that dynamic right they start off right they've got the the right idea and then it always just yeah. kind of they lose it by the end. Yeah, that, Strawberry that... Fields as well. If you think about her, she's brought in and she's like this peppy field agent, and yeah, she just ends yeah. up getting fridged as well, doesn't she? It's um, that's yeah. true. It's it is a shame. Yeah. Well, hopefully that's that's changing now, and and, and uh, no time to die looks like it might be uh, a big change for that. But um, yeah, it's, it's definitely something that's it's not very been well tackled in a lot of the Le Bon films. So Barbara Bark um, remarked after the film her views on Bond. <laughs> He's a chauvinistic pig who uses girls to shield him against bullets. You can't really argue with that, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> does that literally in a lot of cases, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, there's quite a lot. <laughs> he'll, he'll just turn them into the bullets or knives or whatever. He, he doesn't seem to yeah. mind. Uh, so Barbara Bark, who portrayed Anya Amasova, uh, is born in 1946 in New York. She is is married to English musician and Beatles drummer Sir Ringo Starr, which I'm sure is pretty common knowledge. So her That's official involved. title is Lady Starkey. Mm. That's her official title. Um, okay. She retired from acting in 1986, so not not that long, after like nine years after um, Spy Who Loved Me. And yeah. pr- prior to that, most of her films were in Italian. She's fluent in Italian and... and Mm-hmm. A large proportion of them. Not that she did that many films, and it's fifteen she did, but the ones before Spyro Love Me are Italian language. So she struggled with alcoholism and heavy drug use in her past, along with her husband. So they actually checked into rehab in nineteen eighty eight and have remained sober ever since. Mm. Um thus this prompted them to set up self help addiction recovery program with the former wife of George Harrison and Eric Clapton. That is the same woman. Uh, and both... Right. Of them... <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, they've set up that. I was in 1991. And also with Ringo Starr, she's created the Lotus Foundation. So she's big on the charity work. Uh, keeps after, her busy. Uh, keeps her busy after, after retiring from acting. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. 
other than that, there's. I mean, she's done a photo shoot, a Bond girl special photo shoot in the eighties. But other than that, mm-hmm. it's pretty, uh, pretty much done for. Because with her, rea- with her retiring anyway. There's... Yeah, yeah, interesting. She's she's probably one of the. I imagine if if they did, uh, they made Spy Love Me Now with uh, a female character of Triple X, they'd probably be talking about that becoming a spin off as a as a completely new Bond yeah. um, series, uh, the Triple X series. But um, that's true. Vin Diesel's yeah, it, got it the name, seems... I think, on that one. So. I, well, it could it could blend it probably. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's it. I always think it is a shame with um, th- th- that that film because it, it does work. So she's such a good character to begin with, and then it's it, it happens many times. But I always feel with um, Asian Triple X that that's the biggest loss that they had in that. Whereas she could have finished that film being being Bond, but wouldn't, it wasn't. Wouldn't it have been more interesting had they have kept it with them matching each other for so long throughout that film? Keep it at that. Where they match each other all the way through. Right, she has to end. rescue that, him in the end. That would be good, wouldn't it? Yes, yeah. it just wasn't cool. in that in that Bond kind of formula, was it? They just wouldn't allow it that that, that, yeah. that to happen. They had to it had to end in a certain way. But it it would have been so good, wouldn't it, to have them? It's it's a shame. Right. It, it feels as though because you need that to happen at the end, you're throwing away all the good work you've you've put in. You know, yeah, create, well, it, creating it, it, a character. It, 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 it just destroys a character arc, doesn't it? Yeah. And you, you're building up a character, and then oh, well, actually, forget about that. Yeah. Finish it off with Roger being a hero again, please. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but yeah, in really interesting character, and um, yeah, one of the one of the big one of the big Bond girls in in the list. Yeah. There we go, Major Anya Amasova. A is for Apted, Michael Apted. So as you'll probably know, Apted director of The World Is Not Enough. He only did one Bond film, like so many of the later Bond directors. But he's a very interesting choice for Bond director because he was very different than, than most of the directors that we've seen before and, and after uh, The World Is Not Enough. He was born in 1941, so he's 79 now. He's from Aylesbury in Buckinghamshire. He's got quite an interesting kind of bio, bio um, from his start in the in, in the film career. He began his career in television as a six-month trainee at Granada Television in Manchester, where he worked as a researcher. He, he one of his first projects, and it's it's pretty much the project that defines his career it, more more so than the, than the Bond. Uh, the world was not enough. Um, it, he worked on the Up series. I don't know if you know the Up series or you remember it. So the Up series is um, actually I'll go into the Up series in a bit. I'll just give you a bit more information on because it's quite a big section. He he's one of the most prolific English film directors of his generation. He's famous for as well as those two things, a film called an American film called The Coal Miner's Daughter. I don't know if you've seen that one. Um, that's actually a biopic about a country and western singer. I can't remember her name, but um, that 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 was uh, the last film received that film received seven Academy Award nominations, including Best mm. Picture. So it's a pretty big deal. He's he's a really he's quite a prolific award mention director. A lot, most of the things he's done are quite they have a lot of gravitas. He doesn't do tend to do a lot of kind of simple things. Um, he also directed Nell, nineteen ninety four. That's um, Jodie Foster film uh, about a girl who feral girl, in, isn't it? Feral girl, yeah. Um, so you might be noticing the theme here. Strong female leads. Uh, on... Loretta Lynn is coal miner's daughter. That's really. the one, yeah. yeah. Um, Loretta Lynn. He was elected in 2003 to be president of the Directors Guild of America. And he returned to television later on after after Bond to direct three episodes of the TV series Rome. I don't know if you've seen that. I haven't seen it. That's yeah. quite good, though. Uh, he also directed Amazing Grace which premiered at the closing of the Toronto International Film Festival in 2006. So all big, quite big achievements, all these things. They're, they're fairly weighty, weighty projects. He's, he's got a son, he had a son called Paul Apted, which you probably don't know of. He's a sound editor who worked on quite a few films, but probably two of the most um, memorable are The Wolverine um, and A Good Day to Die Hard. But he died in 2014, sadly. His career was defined by many things, but really he he was known quite well, or he's known quite well for being quite an, as empathetic style, uh, uh, as well as a focus on on women and how life has changed for women over over the decades since he, since he started directing. And he did start getting involved in film quite early on. But Up, so Up is 
his big thing really and that's that's what he's known for and he's still working on it's a project that he started years and years ago that was that was what he did when um, in 1964 when he f- just started working at, at Granada Studios and up back then was called seven up uh, no link to <laughs> the drink but the whole premise of up is that at the time they interviewed 14 I think seven-year-olds all, all over from all over the place and just found out what they were doing in their life at the time and the idea for the program was and it's still going on is that every seven years they do the documentary again and each one is like its own film so they did 14 up and then they did 21 up and it just similar concept but what's happening at that point in time and what he's doing in that series is he's following how society changes over time he's following how these people's lives have changed and how different lives have, have changed even within the same society really interesting concept and it it's it's a really important documentary it's it's probably one of the most important documentaries people talk about when they're talking about these kind of life pieces uh, it won a peabody award in 2012 um for its creators patience and its subjects humanity and uh 63 up was uh, released in 2019 and that was they're all 63 now from yeah. from when they were seven so that and when he said about that that he he hopes to do 84 up when he's 99 he just keeps he just wants to keep doing it um <laughs> because he's just following the lives of these people he knows them all and, and it's it's such an important documentary and it's been shown it's normally shown on itv i think it was shown in bbc one year but um but it also gets shown in cinemas and, and, and things like that as well um but the interesting thing about it is that the the reason it does so well or one of the main reasons it does so well is that the, the people who speak on it the, the all those people that are involved in it they they, they almost know the, the film team like really well they're so relaxed with them since they've been kids and apted always tries to bring back the same crew even if they're quite old they brings them out of retirement just to work on this one project because if he brings new people in it's not quite the same and they're not as relaxed with him because they need to be able to talk about their lives and all this kind of stuff so a really interesting project and that's i mean that's defined his life until he did world world is not enough so he would he was his career up until that point was largely defined by the, this 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 documentary he made, and he made a lot of other documentaries as well. But this is like the biggest one. So the the producers would have known about this and and pulled him in because of the knowledge that they had of this. Another interesting thing, he actually worked on quite a few episodes of Coronation Street as well, because he worked at Granada <laughs> at the time. Yeah. Um. Uh. Then written by Jack Rosenthal, uh, and they collaborated on, on a number of episodes uh, and film projects. Apt has won several British Academy Awards, including one for Breast Dramatic Director. Uh, made his first feature film in 1972, The Triple Echo, starring Oliver Reed and Glenda Jackson. 1979, he directed the Hollywood-financed Agatha, featuring Vanessa Redgrave. Uh, the majority of Apt's feature films since then have been based around female protagonists, which you've probably seen from what I've said so far. It's quite a common theme with what he does, and as we go into the talk about World's Not Enough, consistently carries on into into his, his bond film he went to the united states in the 1980s where he directed coal miner's daughter which receives several academy awards and then he's also made several films of a strong social message it's another thing that is, defines what he does including uh, the, the 1983 film gawky park which i haven't seen but in some of his other films that he's got uh gorillas in the mist he worked on or directed enigma um and interestingly after everything i've said he also did the Chronicles of Narnia: The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, which uh, I had to had to read, I had to check that a few times just to make sure it didn't quite fit with this list of films I was I was going through. Um, I've not found much information on him discussing that in interviews. Uh, he's worked on loads of documentaries, including uh, Bring on the Night, feature, a feature-length concert film about the making of Sting's first solo album, and he directed the documentary The Long Way Home, which is all about the USSR adventures of Boris Bromechkinov. Romenshikov. Good, yeah. It's easy for you to say. <laughs> um, uh, I'm Moving the Mountain, a feature documentary which probed the orange of the 1989 protests in Tiananmen Square. So, let's get on to Bond. So, the world's not enough. He he, he got brought on to, to, to direct that in between Roger Spotswood, who'd done Tomorrow Never Dies, and Lee Tamahori, who did die another day afterwards and if you look at him against those two directors he's a very different sort of director some of the films that they've directed very action orientated i mean they have done other stuff but they know their way around action films they're you know what you're getting with them and you can kind of see with lee tamahori when he's done another day that is an action film 
through and through. I don't think anyone really talks about the deep plot storyline and any kind of social or gender-based issues around Die Another Day. <laughs> but the world is not enough. It's a little bit different. And, and um, he's, his, his, getting, his involvement in that is, is quite interesting. When he went to meet the Broccolis, he... He wasn't quite sure what they why they wanted him to do it. He was he couldn't quite grasp why why this documentary maker that's not really worked in action films was was um, was being spoken to, to 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 direct the film. But then he realised after after a while that what they wanted was somebody who could work on this kind of female led angle really well and have an understanding of it. Um, but also have this sort of empathy as well. It's not just and this is goes back to talking about the spy love me and triple X and things like that in that they probably looked back and went, we never did that quite right. And in the 1990s, you've got to get that right. It's you know, it's a pretty big feature. And also, they wanted to get more women to watch Bond. So they wanted to make a Bond film that had a strong female lead that wasn't just shoved in to be a, just a, an added extra. She, she, she's actually... Ele- Electra King in it is probably one of... Whether it's done well or not, she's probably one of the most complicated characters in the whole Bond, Bond series. And um, she's also... Up until that point, the and not she, is the one afterwards the only female main villain. Normally, they're kind of additional villains, but um, she's actually the main one, isn't she? She's mm. she's kind of controlling the whole yeah. the whole storyline. So he so when you realise that he 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 grasped why they wanted him and, and realised that that he could actually offer something to to the film and 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 then realised that he he should get involved in it. He's he's in an interview. He also talked a bit about the difference between all these different styles. So if you look at some of the other Bond directors, they're just used to doing big feature films and, and, and action series and stuff like that. So coming on to do another Bond film, obviously they want to do it, but they know how to do it. They're used to it. But for Apted, he's works on a lot of smaller things. He works on documentaries and stuff like that. So the difference between the two things is absolutely massive. And he talks about um, how 42 Up, big project, but it only had eight people working on it. Bonds has like 1,300 people that work on these films across the whole thing, and he's directing the whole thing. So the, it's so it's so different for him to to kind of manage those two processes. So it was quite. Um, so he talks quite a lot about how he did it, and he says that the action things he didn't really do a lot of the action sequences because there was uh, one of the other members of the team actually picked that up. He was there for the story, whereas the the other kind of secondary. Um, team behind it were, were, were pulling together these big action sequences that he didn't have to worry too much about we're talking about the uh, strong female lead specifically of electric king bearing in mind that i grew up in the united kingdom the greatest social revolution of my lifetime has been the changing world of women in society i've tried to avoid cliches i've never allowed women to be ciphers or characters which is quite quite true you see what he's doing he's not he's not just letting them he's not saying i'm going to put women in and she's going to be strong that's it he gets quite into depth in, in depth into these characters and actually uses them to um, develop the story really nicely. And it was that characteristic of, of, of his work that Broccoli and, and Wilson really liked. Another thing that he's quite famous for, which is something that you get from directors that generally do documentaries and things like that, is is a realness. And that realness is quite evident in the world's like enough because he uses a lot of real places. So he uses real buildings and real locations Whereas you don't see that, and you do see it in other Bond films, but he really like wants them to look just like they do in real life. So he uses the MI6 building you remember from The World Is Not Enough, which is which is the same building as 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 it really looks. Millennium Dome he uses that, the Guggenheim Museum as well in Bilbao. So he uses a lot of these locations, and there he wants it to be very real that you you see these you see these sets, and you go, well, that's actually the real one. It's not just a, a, a kind of made up fictional set. Uh, interestingly, he, in an interview he, uh, a bit later, he talks about Skyfall as well, um, and he said he enjoyed Skyfall, but it isn't a Bond film. Um, Ooh, shots and, fired! Yeah, wow. Yeah, shots fired. But he says when he was stepping into the directorial shows, he, he saw the legacy of Bond as one of pretty girls and double entendres, but reflecting on the direction that Mendes took uh, with Craig and the producers have taken with Skyfall, that it's it's not that same premise anymore it's completely changed into a kind of different format of, of film i don't know whether that's um he was saying that's a good thing or a bad thing but um he was i think he's more commentating on the the way it's changed quite a lot in a very short period of time um yeah. but up until maybe world's not enough there was a very strict format for them and that that 
that changed quite drastically when Cray took over and they, they started massively changing how a lot of these things work. Um, he says, maybe those days are over for good and they're right to roll with the punches and move on. Interesting fact for you. In 2006, Apted directed the official film of the 2006 FIFA World Cup, narrated by Pierce Brosnan. Ah. <laughs> oh. Which is a nice link. Here's a really good fact, which I actually found by pure chance, by trawling through information. Um, he's in the spy lo- Spies Like Us as uh, an extra character called Ace Tomato Agent. <laughs> and if you go on to Google you, and type in Spies Like Us Ace Tomato Agent, you can find him in, in this scene, which is, I think it's his only acting credit he's ever done. So that's a pretty good acting credit to have. Mm, right. Um, also, his favourite films, according to IMDb, IMDb, are Wild Strawberries, Kez, Night and Fog, This is Spinal Tap, and Pulp Fiction. There you go. Interesting ones. And um, he was offered the opportunity of directing That'll Be the Day, but turned it down on seeing the film when it was released. Re- Realising that he made a mistake, he accepted the chance of directing the sequel, Stardust. It's, uh, it's uh, the two films that stars David Essex in it. But Stardust did really well at the cinema, so, um, or really well when it came out. So um, he made the right choice with that. That must have been so, yeah, that's... years ago. Yeah. 74? He's been working for a long time, Apted. He's, well, yeah, he's done a lot. And he's, it's, it's quite an interesting one. I mean, you look at some of these IMDb um, kind of directorial lists and you kind of go, yeah, that's, I, can see, I can see they direct all those films. His IMDb is so eclectic and all over the place. It's, it's some of the stuff you have to read into it and go, what is that? Is that a, is that a film? Is that a, a little documentary? Is it something else? But he's definitely, he was picked up for World Is That Enough because he had all these skills. And at the time, they probably said we want to shake things up and want to make things a bit different and, and kind of move things on. And um, I think, I mean, World Is Not Enough is a, it's a, it's a, a well made film. There's a lot of nice elements to it. It's not one of my favourites, but you can see it's, it's complex, isn't it? It's got a lot of depth to it. It's um, a good one. It's interesting that you said about the female leads because that's the one with Christmas Jones in, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's yeah, a I'll, good point. Actually, I hadn't thought about that. I was biting my tongue the whole time you were saying that. <laughs> that is that is very strange, isn't it? You've got on one side one of the most well defined female characters, and then he's basically just. Do you think he's just given up on that? I've used it all up now. Well, if she just is a doctor. <laughs> yes, uh, let's a just, nuclear just physicist. Re- yeah. Yeah, let's just reference that he does say he likes to... Um, I've never allowed women to be ciphers or caricatures. <laughs> so um, it's almost yeah. like that, that, that they've accidentally pulled her forward a film and she should have been in Die Another Day. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I wonder, I wonder what his thoughts are on that when they, <laughs> when they, when they sent him the script over and he got to that point. What? What's going on? With especially, Christmas especially, that, especially that line. Uh... Yeah. Yeah, maybe he wasn't in that day, and they just yeah get it get, get it, it done. He, he won't like that. Um, but yeah, made, uh, he made extreme measures as well before Bond. Which extreme is, measures, yeah. yeah. Hugh Grant and Gene Hackman. Yeah, so we got a little bit of kind of. It wasn't. It was a little bit of action, wasn't it? In that, it was yeah a bit high octa higher octane. But um, he's definitely not done. He's not. He's not got the CV of a an action director or a kind of thriller director. He's very. More of a journeyman, almost. If he wasn't the Directors Guild president, I would have called him a journeyman. But obviously, he obviously yeah. knows his stuff, doesn't he? But uh, yeah. Well, you if go. you were gonna pick, if you were gonna pick somebody who could formulate and design a character study, you'd want somebody who do. I mean, somebody who's worked on Up. He must know more about the human character than anyone in filming it, because he must see the difference between doing it. Absolutely. Between every every stage of someone's life. So yeah, mm. really interesting director and. Um, Definitely a lot more interesting. Than some of the some of the some of the other more kind of action orientated ones. So yeah, Michael Apted. A is for Armstrong, Vic Armstrong. Uh, now Vic Armstrong is a stunt performer, coordinator, filmmaker. Um, he has. But two main contributions to the Bond world. First of all, as a stunt performer in his own right, and then later on as an action director, second unit action director. And I'll go into a bit more detail about that first. But first, let's talk about Victor Munro Armstrong, born in 1946. 
He's an award-winning film director, stunt coordinator, second unit director, stunt double. According to the Guinness Book of World Records, he's the world's most prolific stunt stunt double. Mm-hmm. Um, and his credits are insane. Um, now, um, Vic's got a brilliant book out, and uh, much of this research comes from there. It's called The World's Greatest Stuntman, and I would heartily recommend it. It's a fascinating read. Uh, films he worked on in the James Bond world were You Only Live Twice, On a Majesty's Secret Service, Live and Let Die, Never Say Never Again, Tomorrow Never Dies, The World Is Not Enough, and Die Another Day. What a span. Well, that's, that's like three decades. Yeah. Four decades. Yeah. It's amazing. His input is is incredible. So Vic uh, comes from a horse horse orientated family. Now his father was the head farrier to the British Olympic equestrian team from 1948 to 1964, and so uh, he looked after all their gold medal horses during that time. And um, so Vic Vic quit school at the age of 14 to become a jockey himself. He wanted to become a national hunt jockey. Um, uh, That was his passion. but uh, after the family lived in Kenya uh, for a few years, they moved back to England in 1956. And this is when the, uh, Vic's father uh, expanded his uh, horse training um, side of the business to not just do professional, but just to look after other people's horses as well. And one of those people was an actor called Richard Todd. Uh, now, Richard Todd's quite a famous actor. He was very uh, famous uh, actor of the time. And uh, he was in Robin Hood, Rob Roy and all these other, all these other films. So now Richard Todd um, basically opened Vic's eyes to the world of films. So now luck would have it, Vic hadn't really thought about coming going to, into the film world, but he had a, a friend, a family friend called Jimmy, uh, Jimmy Lodge, who was the best riding stuntman in the world. And uh, he was working on a film called Arabesque, where one of the vid- uh, stunt doubles fell off and injured himself. And so Jimmy uh, phoned Vic's dad looking for a replacement horse. Sorry, it's the horse that was injured, not for not the not the stuntman. But um, so Vic's family replaced the horse, um, and they told them that you know Vic could have a job riding horses as well if he was interested. So he went to the set, was paid twenty pounds a day, and that was basically the start of his uh, stunt mm-hmm. double career. Pretty good pay. Yeah, twenty quid Very a day nice. when you're that mm-hmm. age. Yeah. Um, so. Vic's involvement in the Bond world uh, began with You Only Live Twice. So this is um, for the scene that we talked about earlier This is in You Only Live Twice where the uh, Secret Service infiltrate Blofeld's lair. So obviously this set was huge, the one designed by Ken Adams, 125 foot drop down into the volcano. And it required 120 stuntmen. And so every, according, according to Vic's book, every stuntman in England was called to Pine, Pinewood. And that includes Vic Armstrong, uh, in which he plays, plays a ninja. And so, uh, the hit, I mean, we could do a whole podcast on Vic Armstrong and, and, and his stories. But um, they basically, they did this 125 foot drop down into the volcano. They didn't use any safety lines. They just basically held onto the rope. And um, the stunt coordinator, Bob Simmons, gave them like a length of like garden hose to, to slow themselves down and Vic was like the strongest because he was a horse rider he was able to drop all the way down and just stop himself at the bottom but um yeah one wow. stunt man at the time 120 stunt men doing that. I mean, the odds of one of them falling off is quite high if you've got that many people yeah and one did actually uh, hit the ground and break uh, both of his ankles or heels or something oh. so yeah wow uh, so yeah, really... imagine that if they but if that happened in a film these days yeah so that then you know when when you're a stuntman and you can say oh what, what have you been working on you can say i was working on the james bond film that really opened up all all the doors that, um in the film world for him so that it, mm. he next worked with the broccolis on chitty chitty, chitty chitty bang bang obviously and then we fast forward to 1969 on a majesty's secret service so visiting uh his dad's farm uh vic vic was there and the phone rang and so vic answered the phone and the, and the person on the other end said are you available next week and he said yeah he said okay i'll get back to you and so then he went home um uh, and they phoned again and said oh right so um we're gonna fly you out to tuesday to switzerland and he said oh, oh that's okay yeah what, what film is it and he went it's it's for james bond so he was just like brilliant i'm in <laughs> and so he flew out to Switzerland to film on a Majesty's Secret Service for two weeks. Um, and he was there to do the raid on Piz Gloria uh, with the helicopters, jumping out of helicopters, mm-hmm. firing guns. B- a brilliant scene. Uh, but he ended up actually staying in Switzerland to do second unit shooting for months. He stayed, he stayed there for ages. Uh, now, this shoot was um, 
famously like quite treacherous it snowed horrifically and they weren't able to do very much on the second unit for a long time and that and basically the broccoli's uh harry saltzman and cubby broccoli got so annoyed with the lack of work they were doing they fired the director in the second unit and w- replaced him with john glenn who we will t- yep. talk about in later detail but he went on to make five bond films himself so Vic doubled for George Lazenby in some of the fight scenes, and he did the iconic scene where um, Bond goes to the edge, of, hangs off the edge of a cliff, and so Vic doubled him uh, for that as well. Mm-hmm. Was he was was he trained to do fighting or anything, or was he just? Well, it was the horse riding the that started him off, and then I think they just sort of picked it up along the way. And, and at, at the mm-hmm. time, it's quite a small industry, the stunt industry, and so they all just taught each other basically. I suppose, um, I suppose a lot of the earlier Bond films, they're not really using martial arts are they it's really no. you can quite easily chore- choreograph those yeah parts. and that's really where Vic came into his into his own really because he was learning all that stuff and was able to do it later on himself and mm-hmm. I'll, I'll talk about some of the other stuff that he worked on but he was instrumental in a lot of these other films that he, he did so next Bond film Live and Let Die uh, now he uh, doubled for Roger Moore um, basically Roger Moore's stunt double was a guy called Les Crawford and one day he just fell ill and so he, they said who can we get in looked in the phone book under the stunt man the first one that comes up A A for Armstrong Vic Armstrong get him in and so Vic stepped in and he did the scene where he's tied to solitaire in the um, uh, in, in um, Mr Big's oh, lair yes. He's tied back to back, and yeah. then he, he 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 basically escapes from there. He jumped down, injured his heels in the stunt, but um, he basically he, he he walked it off, put some t- tissue paper in his, in his shoes, and did it again. He was just oh, stunt man for you. Machine. <laughs> so following that, um, he you've then got to went, be like that if you're a stunt man, haven't you? You've you got to, to. you've got to be able to twist an ankle and go, I'm fine. Yeah, you have to. <laughs> So following that, uh, he would go on to double for Christopher Reeve on Superman and the Superman films. He was also Harrison Ford's stunt double on the Indiana Jones films. And later on, he would become Sean Connery's main guy as well. So we'll, we'll come to that in a minute. Um, mm. So between Live and Let Die and his next James Bond film, sorry, uh, sorry his next James Bond film was uh, Never Say Never Again. So do we count this as a Bond film or do we not? Probably not, but we'll talk about it anyway. But anyway, he was doubling for Sean Connery in this film. And his wife, Wendy, who was also a stunt performer, she doubled for Kim Basinger. Mm-hmm. Basinger? Basinger? Never really sure on that one. So I think it's preference. <laughs> and so they do the scene, the famous scene in that, where they jump off uh, the, a castle into the water on the back of a horse. Um, and that caused a bit of a, a stink with the RSPCA. But um, yeah, that's an amazing scene. It's like literally seconds on screen. It's um, it's, it's crazy. I've watched that film recently and I can't remember that scene. I, I must be shutting off at a certain point. <laughs> so he after that uh he um his involvement he, he was offered to, to work on the living daylights and he worked on screen tests for that film to find roger moore's replacement as bond um mm-hmm. and then he went on to work uh on the uh pierce brosnan bond films uh he says in his book he says when i worked on the pierce brosnan films i was never allowed to mention never say never again Barbara Broccoli and Michael G. Wilson always frowned when I spoke about it. They said, don't swear in front of us. <laughs> I, I don't know why they would, because it it was did quite badly and nobody liked it. I, I thought they would quite be quite pleased Still at that. Still a lot but... of animosity around that film. But anyway, he met with Martin Campbell about to, shooting Goldeneye, but Vic was insistent that he would do stunt coordination and second unit. Martin Campbell decided against it and got two separate people to do two different jobs there. So... He finally then got brought into the fold to do more on Bond with Tomorrow Never Dies. Uh, so director Roger Spottiswood, he'd worked with Vic Armstrong on a film called Air America. That's, um, mm-hmm. Great film. Robert Downey Jr. and Mel Gibson, I believe. Mm-hmm. So anyway, Roger Spottiswood called Vic. He said that he'd been offered Bond. Um, and the producers had told him if he didn't take it, that they, would gonna, they were going to give it to Vic Armstrong. <laughs> right, yeah. They so use this, they, this style quite a lot, don't they? So Same Spottiswood... Yeah, so Spottiswood took the job and first thing he did was called up Vic Armstrong and said, I'm really sorry, will you do it? But will you, I'm going to do it, but will you do second unit? So there you go. He signed up to do second unit. Now him and uh, Spottiswood worked together, Vic Armstrong and, and Spottiswood, to come up with the pre-credit sequence idea and that's the arms deal that takes place and Bond uses mm. the jet plane to shoot everything up and it's a brilliant... Yes, yeah. so that's he, quite good, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he coordinated that and then um, he also did the motorbike scene where they're chasing through... Is it Vietnam? 
uh, and, and they do the jump over the helicopter. Is and that he was, in Hong Kong? Uh, Hong Kong, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. That's fantastic. Then, it's the highlight of the movie. Yeah, I mean, it's a brilliant chase sequence. Um, and then he also did the... Uh, they came up with the remote control car scene, in which we'll talk about uh, again in another episode, I'm sure. Famously filmed in Brent Cross Shopping Centre. So oh, I didn't actually know no, that. Didn't know yeah, that. but that was him and Spottiswood came up with that. Mm. The World Is Not Enough is his next Bond film. Uh, he again shot second unit and the action unit. He came up, uh, or he at least he worked with Apted on the pre credit scene where they chase up the Thames. Um, and then he also worked on the ski scenes in Chamonix where they're being chased by the Parahawks. Uh, yeah. Coordinated the helicopter attack with the chainsaw. Um, and so that bit, that's quite interesting. They shot that at Pinewood. Because obviously the famous bit where there is it a caviar or an oil line factory? Ca- ca- caviar, yeah, yeah. And so um, they they did that with the with the cars chasing around on the wooden bridges and stuff. And anyway, they shot that yeah. at Pinewood. And then to get the shots of the helicopter in Armstrong's book, they explained they basically took the whole top part of the set to older shot, rebuilt it, and then they flew helicopters over it. So when you see them looking up, it's in older shot. When they're looking down, <laughs> it's at Pinewood. It's amazing. That's really interesting. So uh, Vic Armstrong's last Bond film was Die Another Day. Uh, again, he was second unit action director on that one. He filmed the hovercraft, hovercraft scenes uh, at the start in Aldershot. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, that's set in Korea, but they filmed it again in Aldershot. And his crowning achievement, in his, uh, in his own words, is the Ice Lake car chase. Uh, right. So this is the famous sequence on the Ice Lake. And it is amazing Very- because they did do it for real. Um, yeah. They had to make the cars, uh, he said that we can do it, but the, he, he insisted that they make the cars four-wheel drive. He says if you do it with the, the, the Aston Martin and the Jaguar, they're just going to be skidding all over the place. So he said, yeah. we can only do it if you make them four-wheel drive. That cost him a million pounds just to make the cars four-wheel drive. Oh, wow. And he's, yeah, he calls this scene his proudest achievement as an action director. However, <laughs> you'll like this, he calls the paragliding scene, which uh, is obviously the thing that everyone mentions about uh, Die Another Day. He says yeah. it's one of the worst sequences in Bond history. He describes it as absolute garbage, appalling CGI nonsense. Well, he'd know, wouldn't he? Co- that's correct. Yeah, that's a pretty good review. Well, he if, was he, the... if he's saying that, I'm, I'm going to stick with it. Yeah, I mean, he was obviously very practical, stuntman sort of orientated, wanted to do everything for real, but, you know, they yeah. did the CGI on that. Well, this is that's the problem with that. The fact they did the ice chase for real makes the CGI look even worse. Yeah, it does. Yeah. yeah, it really does. And, you know, he just says you lost, you lose the trust with with the audience at that point. Yeah, yeah. And, um, mm-hmm. and it's so true. And, you know, you, they've never, I mean, they do use CGI, but you don't really see it at that extent. You haven't seen it to that extent in a Bond film since. Yeah, you've got to have some mm-hmm. tangibility in the scene, haven't you? You can't just yeah. have the whole thing CGI'd. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And especially yeah. with Jason Bourne coming up next, there's no way they'd get away with that. So we'll leave the final word on Vic Armstrong uh, to Piers Brosnan. Um, this is, uh, in again, in Vic's book. Uh, he's, Brosnan said, Vic was a great guy to work with on the Bond films and a legendary stuntman. He's somebody who, when he walks onto the film set, fills you with the greatest of confidence. And most of all, he knows what makes a great action sequence. He's the man. And that's Brosnan. Uh, oh, that's well, nice. it, well, I'm sticking with Brosnan then. That's, that's a pretty yeah. good uh, testimonial. And I just, uh, I'm going to have to mention it because I do. I've got Vic's book and he signed it, dedicated it to me because I, I met and I interviewed Vic many years ago um, and I ended up doing an onstage Q&A with him and he was just the nicest wow. guy you could ever meet. Um, and, you yeah. know, he's still working in the film. He, he directed a film for Nicolas Cage a few years ago. Didn't didn't do that well, but um, <laughs> uh, both of his sons are stunt coordinators stunt performers in their own rights um wow. and i bet yeah. there's a good quote from nicholas cage about him probably probably <laughs> but yeah that's um that's vic armstrong so uh, amazing yeah. he's uh, just the amount of stuff you must have to know because you're not to to be that to be able to pull these scenes together like when you're on the ice just as just to know that the cars will do this on the ice and then the next day you're on a mountain and you're going right you're going to need this this and this to get this mountain mm-hmm. scene right it's like knowing 50 different skills it's not just it's not just like understanding cars and stuff is it you have to know everything because if you get something wrong it's just not it's gonna look awful or yeah. or, or get or you know someone could die 
It's well, someone could die, yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's yeah, this, that that path of his learning from the, being on the ranch to doing that kind of stuff is just phenomenal. That yeah, that's incredible, amazing life. Yeah, and and just sort of speaks volumes about you know that how those films the films are made in a very family atmosphere, right? You you, you do yeah. one film and you just keep coming back. They like you, yeah. you get on with people. It's just yeah. a job for life, isn't it? Uh, and you've seen a lot. Probably, yeah, and and that it's the same with the exactly the same as stuff like having John Barry involved and and and, and Maury Spinder and all those because his style of doing those things is probably so specific and you could probably sit there i bet i bet you could do a quiz and show some stunt scenes and go which one wasn't him and you go what's that one isn't it because it hasn't got that hallmark style it's not really pushing the boundaries whereas you see a lot of stunt scenes in Bourne films and stuff like that and they're a little bit they look fine but they're not exciting enough you know they always try and push the boundaries of of, of the stunt scenes like when they in man with golden gun where he did the, the corkscrew turn over the bridge and that was the first time anyone ever tried anything like that that kind of defines Bond, doesn't it? Having those like modern ways of doing things that you've never seen before. But it's not necessarily the concept that's new. It's just the way they do it. It's just nicer and just looks great. They push yeah. about push the boundaries. Yeah, Vic Armstrong. Yeah. There you go. Great stuff. So that's it for the first James Bond A to Z podcast. Thanks for listening. And if there's anything we've said or any research we've got that isn't sound quite right, shoot us an email. We'd love to find out a little bit more about each of these points we've talked about in the podcast. Butler, what have we got coming up next time? On the next episode of the James Bond A to Z podcast, we'll be talking about Arnold, David Arnold, the composer, and also Aston Martin, the car brand that's had a long and fascinating history with the James Bond franchise. Thank you very much for listening. Please leave us a review where you're listening to this podcast. It'd be much appreciated. And if you want to follow the podcast on Twitter, you can find us at James Bond A Z. Can't wait. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for listening. See you later. Bye. The James Bond A to Z podcast features Tom Butler, Brendan Duffy, and Tom Wheatley. The podcast was produced by Tom Wheatley with music by Tom Ingemels and artwork supplied by Helen Dolly.